I've been in search and rescue now for several years. I've seen an interesting thing or two. From the moment I took this job, I knew it would be an experience. But out there taught me that there's always more to life than what you think. It made me appreciate the little things in life that I never really considered before. You see, searching for somebody can be one of the most frustrating challenges you can ever face. But at the same time, it could be one of the most rewarding experiences once you find them. One of the very first people that I had to go and look for was this child who had fallen off a small cliff. They must have been no older than six or seven. And while we found them out alive, there were some very strange circumstances surrounding this kid's fall. First off, when we found him, he was still in relatively good spirits, having been missing for six hours. He suffered no more than a broken leg and a fractured rib. That kid was pretty tough for having what happened to him, but it's what he told us of what happened that really didn't make sense. See, he was roughly about 50 feet ahead of his family when he explains to us that some large man pushed him off the side of the cliff. And although this could have been impossible, he was all by himself, at least 50 or so feet away from his family, and there was nobody else next to him or around him. But his story never changes, even when questioned on multiple different times. He explains that a tall, large, bulky man in all black shoved him off the cliff, and that's why he went tumbling. When we asked the parents and the family, they said that they looked up and just saw him almost lose his balance and fall. The kid's story never changes, even now. While he's cleared out of having mental health issues, he seems genuinely frightened when he talks about seeing this man that shoved him. He also went on to say that this same large, dark man also followed him the entire time he was on this trail that led right around to the small cliff. But while that kid ended up fine and alive, there are other situations when I've dealt with hikers who are unfortunately never found. I often hear about cases where people are never found with virtually no trace of them ever left. Search teams often bring out their dogs and aren't able to find any scent. It's as if they just vanished, disappeared into the woods, as if consumed by Mother Nature itself. Sometimes we find shoes, or articles of clothing, but that's never guaranteed. And sometimes, even our most trained search dogs just flat out lose their scent. How is that even possible? And in fact, there was one time where one of my close colleagues saw something in the woods that changed their entire personality. And this was a time where we were dispatched to help a woman who had gotten lost in the woods. Well, we found her almost eight hours later near a creek. She was sitting on top of a rock and had been crying. When she saw us in the clearing coming towards her, yelling at her, she quickly told us to get out of here, that it is still around. While ignoring her pleaded cries, we came to her rescue and got her out of there, our whole team. Her physical appearance hadn't changed much, but she had been scratched up and dinged pretty good, almost as if she had been dragged through the woods or so it looked like. When we asked her about what do you mean by it is still around, she wouldn't speak. She had been clearly very traumatized by someone or something. We can never exactly find out who or what, but the most we can get out of her is that something very large chased her into the woods and was apparently keeping her there, not allowing her to leave. Whatever it was apparently let us take her, which I don't exactly know what that was all about. Now, my colleague whose personality was drastically changed by this experience supposedly saw whatever it was, and she also refuses to speak on it at all, won't even answer questions on it, and just prefers to deal with her own business. After this case, she ended up going on leave for about two weeks. When she came back, she was totally different. It was like dealing with a trauma victim or something. So, as you can see, we deal with all sorts of stuff on the job. Stuff that I don't always feel that we are equipped to handle, but that's besides the point. I took an oath when I took this job, and after having doing this career for quite some time now, I never thought that this job would take my life to the places that it's at now. 
while it's given me so many opportunities to explore and expand my horizons, it's also made me appreciate the sanity and simplicity that life has given us that we all sometimes take for granted. You know, they say you don't know what you have until it's gone, and I know that all too well. It's my job to not only protect the public, but other rangers as well. But we have to protect our staff and each other. If they're not aware of what's going on, it's harder to get everybody on the same page. After all, we are a team. So my hope is that my fellow colleagues can be much more open about discussing strange things going on. And I would love to see more transparency between fellow search and rescue officers and other rangers. Thank you for reading the story, and please enjoy the rest of your day. If you wish to contact me about something directly related to what it was written, feel free. And just remember that the following are some safety precautions that you may want to take if you plan on going into any national park. Make sure to always follow the instructions on signs. Don't enter prohibited areas. Don't feed or approach wildlife. Keep your pets under control at all times. Remember to tell somebody where you are going. Bring plenty of food and water and supplies, as well as a first aid kit and extra clothing layers, in case it gets cold or wet. Always be aware of your surroundings and stay on the designated trails. Be careful out there, and best of luck. I've had some pretty wild stuff happen to me while working search and rescue. There's something that happens every once in a while, when we're out on a search. We like to refer to it as the architecture of fear. The person who finds these strange, inexplicable things will usually go silent and refuse to talk about it afterward. The first time I saw one of these unexplained things, it was around 2 in the morning. I was searching for a young woman who'd gotten separated from her hiking group. We were out past dark, of course. Our bloodhounds had picked up her scent. But unfortunately, when we found her, she was deceased. But what didn't make sense was the state her body was in. The medical examiner said she had been dead for roughly two weeks, based on the state of decay she was in, which was impossible. She hadn't even been missing for more than 12 hours when she was found. So for her to have been that decayed, that means something must have happened that is beyond our realm of comprehension and normality. I had questioned at one point if a state of rapid or advanced decay is possible, even acceleration, but none of that is possible, not to this degree, even based on the temperature, climate, humidity, or any other exterior forces working on her decay process. Something else that was extremely odd about the case was the medical examiner decided to do an autopsy only to find out that her right lung and her heart were completely gone, just missing, not torn out, or her chest ripped open. There had been zero incision wounds anywhere on her body, and when inspecting on her organs, they all appeared to have been exposed to a very high temperature, judging by what the medical examiner had released. He did not go into specifics about if the heart or lung had been torn out, cut out, or what. Something else is that the base of her spine had over a hundred very tiny fractures, which did not make any sense at all. Her body had been discovered around the bottom of a ravine, but nothing to indicate that she fell. What's also strange is she was nowhere around this ravine when she had been reported missing. In fact, the last place she had been seen was roughly six miles away from this spot, and at the bottom of this ravine was completely out of the way. One would have to climb over very large rocks and boulders to even get down here. Virtually impossible for a woman of this size. She was roughly about 28 to 29 years old. 5'2", 120 pounds. Tiny girl. One of the other things I wanted to include in this is that when she was found, she had the look of horror on her face. Eyes wide open. Mouth agape. She had seen something that clearly spooked her. But what? That's not the only story I wanted to share with you. There's another one I have. This man we'll refer to as Red Elk. Now, this man was an interesting case. We had gotten the tip-off and report that he had gone missing 
after going on a camping trip with some close buddies. We were told that no alcohol or drugs or any sort of inebriating substance was involved, and he simply just wandered off from camp too far and got lost. Very traditional. We made it to the area where they said the last place this guy's phone signal had pinged before we got an emergency response call, saying they were needed further north. Something that's also interesting to note about this case was his other buddy was also missing too. So, after responding to the call, apparently they had found his dead body. Now, the spot in which he died was a small clearing. The man was completely naked, no clothes on at all, and appeared to have died from exposure, although he wasn't found huddled in a ball or in the fetal position, like many people do. He had simply collapsed on the ground. No wounds or any markings would indicate he suffered any exterior damage. It's as if he had just stripped himself naked and collapsed on the ground. Now, his buddy who had died was found only a mere 10 meters away from his body, and his buddy had been killed in a much different way. We found his buddy in chunks. It's as if whatever or whoever killed him had torn him in pieces. Not the same way an animal would, where it would tear at a ravaged corpse. He was literally in chunks. He had also not appeared to have been eaten on, and there were no flies or smell of death surrounding either of them. Very strange. Something else I really wanted to mention about the bizarre nature of this case is that the man who was found in chunks... There was zero traces of any blood at all. Not even any coagulated blood. You figured being found like this, it would be a mess. But it wasn't. It's as if the man had exploded in ribbons, but yet no blood or gore. Just tons of pieces of flesh and tissue. Neither of these men had been dead longer than six hours at max. While we didn't get to work on the case long, our supervisor was very quick to step in and inform us that a different branch was going to handle this specific case, and that we were to no longer talk about it, think about it, work on it, anything. We were also not allowed to discuss details of this specific case, which is why I'm keeping myself anonymous while sharing this with you. There were only four of us that dealt with this, so if this story gets too big, well, hopefully it can't be traced back. I guess I'm really putting myself on the line while talking about this. Now, a few years back, we had also dealt with another hiker who was very suicidal. According to his family, he had gone off in the woods to end it all. Well, we found him about four hours later, completely alive, but terrified, sobbing. We assumed he was having a mental breakdown, but that he claimed something very big had chased him this far into the woods. He was only about two miles from where he had last been seen, and he was scared that the big wolf was around. When rescued, it was noted thoroughly that this man had had a history of mental illness. Not schizophrenia, but bipolar disorder, multiple personality disorder, anxiety, but nothing that I remember or recall that would cause him to hallucinate a giant wolf, is what he said. And his story never changed, which was also strange. When asked more about what he supposedly saw, he claims that a giant wolf had chased him into this section of the woods and was surrounding him and stalking him. He didn't give much details, but the guy was clearly completely traumatized by it. After checking on his blood, he was free of any sort of drugs or substances which would rule out him taking any drugs and seeing this. So that's yet another question we don't know about. Now, besides all that, there is something that I did want to talk to you about. One of the most startling things for me, of course, and that is seeing a UFO in the sky. Not first glance, I assumed it was some sort of military craft, just sitting there hovering in the sky. This particular one appeared to be in the shape of a triangle, but kind of black and white, almost as if it was glowing or having a shining white silhouette. I have never seen anything like this in my life. And I'll never forget when doing drills, how we all saw this large black cube, several hundred feet in diameter, just levitating up there in the sky. I have seen many strange shapes in the sky, though. But this one was a whole different anomaly in and of itself. And it wasn't moving. It didn't appear to be hovering, just staying perfectly still. 
as if it was being held by strings or something magically in the sky. By this point, it's possible that some of these things may have been declassified of government aircrafts. We have seen strange jets around, but nothing like this. I'm aware that there are people out there who want to discredit my story for whatever reason, but all I can say is this. You do not go through life without experiencing something supernatural, unusual or unexplainable at least once in your lifetime. It's to me at least three times more. I'm not a believer in this stuff, but I guess I can't really deny what I've seen. As far as the fate of the several strange hikers that I've met, who have died, perished, or have seen the strange and unknown, I don't know if I really have any answers for that. This is my experience I had while working as a park ranger in Oregon. It's not exactly the scariest thing that has happened to me, but it's still pretty messed up. We get occasional calls from hikers out on trails when they're having trouble. One day, I responded to an emergency call. The radio signal we got was from a lost young man who claimed he was being chased down the mountains by something something very large and fast. He didn't have much time before he lost our signal, so we set out with another ranger to try and find him. We went all over the mountain until dark fell, then split into multiple teams for safety reasons and protocol. Those are just the things you do. Me and my team took part of the trail that followed along a very deep chasm right next to a ravine whereas a couple of my partners went up to the last known location where he'd lost radio contact. After about three miles, I saw something moving in the trees ahead of me. It wasn't normal movement. It seemed almost like it was taunting me or playing with me. It's as if whatever it was knew I was approaching. It would suddenly stop moving when I got close. And suddenly, this thing jumps up in the tree climbs up probably about 30 feet and leaps from tree to tree to tree, like a darn monkey. Immediately, I radio my partner, and he tells me that he feels like he's about to be ambushed after hearing heavy footfalls coming toward him through the brush, followed by large growling sounds that I could audibly hear through the walkie-talkie, and some of his team members begin screaming. Before I could even get a word in, this partner of mine begins frantically calling for help, saying he's being attacked. I lose signal over the walkie-talkie, and nothing happens but static. I'm stunned. I'm left literally speechless as I'm holding it, just hearing static. I'm sitting there trying to process what had just happened and not lose sight of the mission, and I hear movement. All the noise around me had ceased, and now... Me and my fellow partners who are with me can hear movement coming in my direction. Several figures, large, judging by the weight and how heavy they moved. Immediately, we decided to retreat from the spot, having no idea what it was we were up against. Now the search had complicated itself even further. Instead of just this being a search for this lone hiker, now it was a search for my partner and his team. I'll spare you some of the additional information. After more and more days of searching, the hiker, the original one who went disappearing, my partner and his team were never found. The last known location was, as I said, roughly three miles from our GPS point. The only thing, the only evidence left behind was blood, and the blood trailed off into the woods and then just disappeared. After doing tests, the blood was indeed human, but could not be matched to any of the partners that I worked with. After that, the dogs lost scent of all the rangers, or any of the rangers who were assembled in that team, which would have been three. I was told to be very hush-hush about this story. I guess my superiors don't like this kind of evidence getting out. Maybe it just reveals their incompetence to handle proper situations. Maybe we're dealing with something more dire that is not supposed to be in the woods. Either way, this job isn't as safe as they always claim. When I was just starting out as a rookie ranger, I was told the 411 about all the strange events 
that have been being reported around here that have taken place. Everything dating back 10 years ago and beyond. Strange sightings. Things that, by the book, did not make sense. This first story happened roughly 12 years ago. It involved a hiker who had gone missing on one of the more popular trails in this park. A park's identity that I will keep anonymous. I can't have any of these things leading back to me. It would ultimately be career suicide, so I have to share this in secrecy. Wish me luck. Anyway, the search teams found his backpack and supplies. Untouched. Unscathed. No dirt. Nothing. The man had been missing for over ten days. Search parties were turned up with nothing. No scent trail. No evidence. Other than his lone backpack and supplies. I didn't exactly deal with the search of this one. But I was told throughout the story that a very primitive campsite was discovered, roughly 12 miles from his backpack, and that supposedly his skeleton was discovered there, but not like a mummy or his whole skeleton. Pieces of his skeleton. The DNA sequencing matched him, but judging by the marks on his skeleton and bones that were found, it appeared that he had been eaten, but it gets even creepier. When studying the bite marks on his bones and the scratches, it appears as if the bite marks fit that of other human dental records, meaning he was most likely eaten by cannibals or consumed by another human being. I don't know if there's any evidence to suggest that he was alive when he was being eaten on or if he was killed and then eaten. We don't know. It's just what I've been told from stories. The primitive campsite in which his body or skeleton was found was pretty much deserted, and had been deserted for quite some time. Of course, there had been no evidence prior or after of any sort of cannibalistic nature from anybody, even reports of it. And that's only one story. Another story that a ranger had told me was that a lone camper had been drug out of his tent in the early morning hours, attacked by some large humanoid animal. When the police and us went to investigate the sighting, we couldn't find anything. His tent was torn up, and there was a lot of blood. The blood led into the forest about a quarter mile of the way, and kind of just stopped. The man missing was a guy by the name of Roger Patterson. He was 59 years old, was kind of a lone wolf, wasn't married, did not have any kids, but he hiked and frequented this area often. Immediately, all of us thought bear attack, but when we looked at the damage on the tent, the way the blood, even the markings on the dirt, there was a struggle, absolutely, but nothing matched that of a bear attack, at least not one traditionally, so to speak. For example, judging by the bite marks and claw marks on the tent, this did not fit anything that was bear related, nor did it fit anything canine as well just in case others tried to assume it was a large lone wolf or a coyote of some sort. Even though this is completely out of the norm, unless supposedly an animal was starving, would they even ever begin to act like this? But forensics and evidence proved that this was simply not the case. Something else had attacked Roger and drug him out into the woods. What's strange is since the blood trail ended about a quarter mile into the woods and just stopped, the dogs acted very skittish and panicked upon reaching this one spot. And this is right where the blood stopped, and the dogs, for whatever reason unknown to me or my partners, would refuse to go any further. Nobody was sure why. I don't know if they sensed something, maybe they smelt something they didn't like, but they would not go any further. However, search was pushed further than that, but there was no trace of Roger anywhere. Other disturbing reports were also reported around this same area in which Roger had gone missing that morning. Within the month's time following his disappearance, other campers and eyewitnesses described seeing a large, hairy ape-like being watching them from the woodline, scaring this one older woman, who was roughly in her early 50s, after she had got out to use the bathroom at about 5 a.m. She came out and saw this thing staring at her from the woods, she described it as really ugly looking, having beet red eyes, and a very smashed in face. 
but she described it as looking very intently at her, as if studying her. Completely terrified, she ran back to her campsite and searched for the nearest ranger to make a report. Her story is just one of several that has happened in this park for years. Now, I've heard from some rangers trying to make a connection between Roger's disappearance and what this woman saw, assuming that Bigfoot or Sasquatch might just be the cause of Roger's demise. Although, the bite marks and the teeth and the destruction of Roger's equipment made us to believe that whatever did it had several rows of teeth, or meaning a snout. I'm no expert on Bigfoot or Sasquatch, but they don't have a snout, at least not that I've ever been made aware of. The only other connections that I could personally attribute to Roger's disappearance and this woman seeing what she did that morning is that other campers in an adjacent camping spot have also talked about hearing strange noises out in the woods at night, specifically things like wood knocking and yelling, and also this weird chattering kind of sound. And sometimes, right around one or two in the morning, they would report about hearing grunting sounds as the distance would get closer and closer, hearing some figures come close to people's tents, sniffing, smelling, and smashing their feet. One gentleman claims that he actually brought his gun and shot at one of these things who was getting too close to his camper. Now, this was at a time before I was ever a ranger here. In fact, this was back in the late 1980s. But the man claims that he was stepping outside of his camper and closing up all of his barbecue equipment. His wife was in the trailer showering or doing something. And he sees this thing kind of just trot out of the woods, heading right up to his camper. The man, completely startled and scared, pulls out his revolver and fires a few shots at this thing. Instead of running and retreating, this thing turns from curious and passive to very aggressive, begins smashing at his camper, smashing part of the window in, completely terrifying the wife inside. And now she's screaming bloody murder. And this thing tries to attack the husband, but he fires one more shot at it, shooting it right through the eye in the skull, killing it. And judging by what I was told, apparently a sect of government had showed up at the park that evening. The man was detained. The wife was detained. The park was shut down, and that camper was also taken in as evidence. Now, I know my place to not ask too many questions, so I only allowed me to be told what I could be told. But from what I was told, that's pretty much the end of that story, and they never really released any more information, or what I can assume is that my supervisors and my fellow colleagues were never told anything more on that case. The park was allowed to reopen about four days afterwards. An older gentleman, the one who told me this story, is probably the only ranger at this park that has been here since the mid-70s. He's an old-timer, but he's been here a very long time, and, well, he's seen it all. And he was working at the park that day that this happened. He said that he had heard the gunshots of the man firing it, and told me that, not long after, these men showed up and made the entire park clear out. They were there for at least 12 hours. And he said afterwards, the body was gone, no evidence could be found, not even any blood. It's like they just came in there very quick, cleaned it all up very quickly, and got out. And he's not even a conspiracy theorist at all, or is even into that realm of information. But he said that something about the whole thing, about them trying to cover it up very quickly, just did not sit right in his stomach. Now, if we fast forward to the future, the lady who much saw one of these things going to the bathroom about 5 in the morning and Roger's disappearance all happened in the early 2000s, much later than this. But ultimately, I believe on paper, Roger's disappearance was marked off as a bear attack, although it should be noted that we have no bears here in this area, at least none that have been spotted. And for a bear to be able to do that to Roger would have to be of gargantuan size, judging by the teeth marks, the bite marks, and the claw marks, and the destruction of his tent and equipment. Nothing added up. I can only assume that there's a cover up there too. Anyway, I don't want to get too conspiracy on you, but these are just some crazy things that have happened in my time as a ranger, or should I say before.
This isn't something I normally tell civilians about, but our park has been having a strange issue. It's dealing with wolves. Very large ones. In fact, we've even been tossing around the old coin term, buffalo wolves. These wild canines of incredible size. You see, we've been seeing the deer population over the last few years severely dwindle to virtually nothing. This park and the surrounding area used to be bustling with deer and all sorts of wildlife, from raccoons, possums, you name it, even lots of birds. But in the last couple years, all of that life, everything, primarily the deer, has all just appeared to vanish. It's too much of a coincidence that these big wolves are coming here. And now, all of a sudden, all the wildlife is now disappearing. Even though I'm not a biologist, it's easy to see that if you put a large predator in an area with lots of food, well, chances are, those predators are going to eat that food and continue to stay there as a reliable food source. This has been proven time and time again all throughout nature, wherever you go in the world. But this isn't just my speculation. We've received many frightening complaints from park visitors about these wolves. Apparently, they aren't just running around eating deer. They're trying to break into people's camps and attacking people. We even have an ordinance up that nobody is allowed to enter into the woods or in the trails at nighttime or after darkfall. And these animals have become increasingly more and more violent. We don't know if that's due to the lack of food that is becoming more and more apparent, or if this is just the nature of these kinds of wolves. Another thing that I wanted to type out, but I'm nervous to mention, I don't want to sound like I'm making this up, but some of the reports of these buffalo wolves is reports of them walking around on their hind legs. I understand, it sounds completely unbelievable, because as you know, and as I know, canines do not do this. While they do possess the ability to temporarily stand on their legs, like we might see in funny YouTube videos, they do not casually walk around and operate as a predator on two legs. But these wolves, there is something different entirely. There's almost a sinister, unnatural quality to them. And judging by a lot of witnesses who have talked about them, are all incredibly frightened by what they see. Now, I have some notes here that I wanted to share with you, because these are some commonalities between all the eyewitnesses that I've personally spoken to on the job. Now, they describe this thing as being well over 7 to 8 feet tall, and they describe their eyes as this unique, almost source of light, dare I say. One man who I spoke to described it the same way that headlights do when they shine into a deer's eyes, except these wolves' eyes were not having any light shine into them. Their eyes just naturally emitted this glow. Personally, I wasn't exactly sure what to make of that information, but that this man in particular was completely frightened by seeing these things. He even told me that when these things are around, they are not like normal animals, and they are certainly not like normal predators. They are not afraid of humans, and they just carry a certain presence around them. When they're there, you know it. And they also have this stench that follows with them. This musty, wet dog smell. Some eyewitnesses whom I've spoke to have described also there being a rotting meat or death smell that is accompanying with the wet dog smell. I can't speak on any of that myself. I've never experienced it. I've not smelt it. And I've not dealt with it. So, I don't know. I can only go by what I have here in my notes as I'm typing this up. But I think when we look at the grand scheme of this, we're talking about a large canid alpha predator here. An animal that can clearly be deemed as incredibly dangerous. And while like other wolves, they are a pack. Because other eyewitnesses have claimed to see more than one. And more than one at a time. I haven't heard it, but some of the witnesses claim that these things make a screaming sound. When I've tried to ask about this more and find out more information... They say this scream is similar to that of a mountain lion, but much deeper in tone, and much more guttural sounding. Kind of like more of a lion roar. Very deep, lots of bass. But there's just something 
what I was told is supernatural about the auditory quality. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but judging from the witnesses I've spoken to, they would all agree. I've even cross-referenced my notes with other eyewitnesses to make sure that it wasn't just some person making this whole thing up. But we have gotten so many complaints and reports about these things, I think there's more here than what we can handle. In fact, just doing a little bit of digging, I found out that there's actually hikers up in Canada is seeing these same creatures going around in small packs, appearing mostly on trails at nighttime. Supposedly that these are also discovered in hot spots with a lot of Bigfoot sightings. I don't know anything about Bigfoot, or if anybody has spotted a Bigfoot here, or let alone if they even exist. But my guess is that if these alpha predator wolves are being discovered up in Canada, they're probably coming down here, the way some animals would migrate. That's my guess. I'm assuming it can only be in search of food or a larger food supply. However, this has been going on for years, so I can only assume that they have now made this place a permanent home, a permanent place of residence. While nobody to my knowledge has died or been viciously attacked by these wolves, I can tell you that, sadly, there have been at least three dogs to my knowledge that have gone missing. One was a Golden Retriever Lab mix, while another was a German Shepherd, and I couldn't tell you what the third dog was, but all disappearing within four months' time. Very shortly after, people first described seeing these things in the park. I can only assume, judging from the evidence I have here in front of me, that this is all interconnected somehow. And I guess that these alpha wolves, or what they are, I'm not sure, have driven off any other predators, like bear, coyotes, wolves. They have established themselves as the top alpha predator of the area. My only hope is that once enough food disappears, they will pick up their things and move to the next area, so to speak. And maybe that will give us a chance for everything to return to normal, for the deer population and wildlife population to regain itself. But my other worry is once that replenishes, will they move back into the area safely and securely, establishing this as their home again? Or will they continue moving on southwestward in search of more and more food? These are all questions that I constantly ask myself, but I can tell you at least one thing. My team of supervisors are not doing anything about it. In fact, I think they're scared to deal with it. And I think they know that what we're dealing with here is something that's definitely not normal. They're trying to make sure that everybody, including the public, stays very, very quiet about this. They don't even want me talking about it. But I feel like it's in my due diligence to let the public know that there is a threat to the common person. And I don't necessarily recommend going out on the trails, especially at nighttime with these things around. There's no telling how predictable or unpredictable these wolves are. And sadly, I believe it's only a matter of time before a human life is claimed, if there hasn't been already, and we just haven't known. I've not dealt with this myself, but many of those at our park have spoken about it, even from an eyewitness of an older man who claims and other people have seen this goat man around the park at night. I get it. Goat man. Isn't that the stuff of urban legends? I thought the same thing too. But with all the overwhelming amount of eyewitnesses about it, maybe there's more to this legend than what I initially thought. In fact, according to one of my fellow rangers, there was a case not too many years back where a young boy had gone missing for about three or four days. He was found about two weeks later, being on top of one of this high plateau. He had literally no memory of how he got there, and he appeared to be in shock during his entire rescue. This is about an eight-year-old boy, and he was using the word a goat man. Now, for this young man to even know what the goat man was, which we all knew at the time was things of urban legend, it would have been impossible. His parents were devout Catholics, they were from a different part of the country, the idea of a goat man wouldn't be even be something in this boy's head. But he kept saying, the goat man took me, the goat man took me. And we would ask him, what do you mean the goat man? 
and an eight-year-old boy, which there's no way he can make this up, claimed that this person or thing or animal was half man, half goat. He claimed that it had hooves just like a goat, but it had arms and a chest like that of a man. And the head was kind of like that of a goat, but with long horns. And it had these nasty sharp teeth, is how he described it. It kidnapped him and fed him berries and meat. The two weeks that he was captured, he said that this thing fed him well. He wasn't in any way, shape, or form malnourished. And as a matter of fact, his clothes looked very clean. For a young man to be lost in the wilderness for that long, he would stink, he would be dirty, his clothes would be filthy, if not tattered. But that was not the condition he was found in. Even his mental state was very good. He had even been hydrated. And he claims that while this goat man was frightening to look at, his words, not mine, it took care of him and made sure he survived. When asked why he was left on the plateau, he explained that the goat man put him up there and said he was not allowed to leave. Which already... His discovery is similar to many other missing 411 sightings that I have been recently made aware of by an amazing researcher by the name of Mr. David Polites. And after reading through that man's books and seeing his research come to life, I realize that there is more horrifying truth to his research than those might realize. Once you work in this industry and job field, you'll soon realize that a book like that that many would write off as just fun fiction is actually reality. These things are happening to people, and they've been happening for a long time. Nobody wants to bat an eye. Nobody wants to realize that this is actually going on, and that there are things going on which nobody seems to have an answer for, or that we can explain. And instead of trying to bring this to the public and get an answer, we want to tuck everything underneath the bed, hide it all, for fear that the public might get scared and freak out for fear that the parks, the public parks, might lose large sums of profit. Even though there are human lives being taken here, families shattered and torn over their deceased loved ones, young and old alike, something needs to change. Something has to end this charade of keeping knowledge hidden. I'm going to try and do my best to bring many of this knowledge to light, to the public eye. I've known that there are many who've tried to do what I do, and end up getting mysteriously killed in the process, or somehow dying at a very convenient time. I'm going to do my best to try and reach out to Mr. Polites myself and see what I can do to bring this information to the world. Clearly, there is something going on. I have seen it. Many fellow rangers that I have worked with and do work with have seen it. I think many of us, including myself, are scared to talk about it. Not only could it be career suicide, but our lives, our livelihood, our family is at risk for whatever is to come. The repercussions being completely unknown, but severe. Greetings. I work in the forest industry as a ranger. I'm from Idaho, or the Idaho side of the Grand Tetons. This is going to sound crazy as heck, but... I swear this has all happened, and I'm not just high on acid or do drugs. Let me date this back for you. In 1997, I was assigned to Grand Teton National Park shortly after graduating from college with a degree in biology. Being a young person to a new area and now working for a living, I was more than ecstatic and excited to get my feet wet in the field of the Forest Service. In fact, my very first autumn season working here was coming up so it wasn't long before my supervisor actually got to take me out on patrols, getting me familiarized with the hiking trails and other areas of interest, such as camping sites, specifically places where wildlife roamed freely. As a matter of fact, on one Saturday, there was supposedly a report of people having in the national park seeing large footprints in the area. Unless there was some mysterious basketball player walking around with size 20 feet, there was no real evidence as to who or what it was made from. Having no other options, I had to take this assignment myself. My coworkers were occupied with deep cleaning and maintaining equipment for the autumn season. Upon arriving at the scene, 
this would have been my first taste that the Bigfoot phenomenon was actually real. The tracks that I saw from my own eyes, but regret not having any plastering with me, were humongous. If you've ever seen those old 90s TV shows, where they showed those guys showing off the plaster cast of Bigfoot feed prints, I always thought those were fake and made up. But I'm here to tell you, after seeing them myself, there is truth to those casts. The indentation alone was more than mind-boggling. These things had to weigh a considerable amount to put in this much force into the mud. And something so large. We're dealing with an animal here that we don't even know. The possibilities could be endless. As I'm studying these footprints, I notice that the stride itself is also incredibly large. Roughly about five feet from step to step. Meaning this thing had to have been huge. I can't recall though in that exact moment if I was immediately thinking of Bigfoot or Sasquatch. I just knew that what I was looking at was unlike any animal I had seen. And I wasn't exactly sure what it could have been or what made it. But just that I was more blown away by the fact that I was staring at human-like footprints that were this large and this deep in the mud. I also recall feeling a very specific emotion that day. Not just fearful, but dread and the unmistakable sensation of being watched the entire time I was looking at these feet prints. Now, I was a newbie, so I was still getting my feet wet, no pun intended, and trying to learn to be well-versed in the wilderness around me, the things to look out for, things to be aware of. My supervisor was able to come by and make a plaster cast of these exact prints, and keep in mind that this particular time was just one isolated incident. Now fast forward a little bit in time, especially all the way up to the year 2005. This had happened multiple times, and not just feet print. I'm talking the whole nine yards. Sightings, seeing these things in the trees, seeing them watching me, feeling their presence, knowing they're there. So I tried to educate myself the best I could watching and binge-watching Sasquatch and Bigfoot documentaries to see if there's anything that might resemble what I saw. Because the things that I saw all looked different. Nothing I saw, or there was never two of these creatures that I saw that looked identical. Maybe identical in height and size, but all the faces looked very different. The first creature I ever saw resembles kind of the creature from the 1980s film. Or maybe it was a TV show. Do you remember the creature Alf? A-L-F. Had a short snout, very ugly looking, black eyes. That's actually very close to the creature I saw. Or I should say the first non-human humanoid creature that I saw. I caught it watching me through some thick blackberry bramble one summer morning. The next was seeing a group of these creatures off in the trees together. These ones that I saw were flat-faced and had a face that was more akin to a large ape, a flat nose, very deep-set in black eyes, and large sagging lips. Whereas the third account I saw, this being looked much more humanoid, or Neanderthal, I should say. If you took off all the hair off its body, it would look very much like a man, a native man. And my first three accounts actually happened from 1998 to 2001. It's in that time that I really started to grow more comfortable with the idea that these are actually Bigfoot and Sasquatches. Although I was still very ignorant on that kind of knowledge. I didn't exactly know yet what cryptozoology was. I didn't know much about these beings. But I knew they existed and I knew they were there but I tried not to really think about it much or acknowledge the fact that they did exist. And I especially did not talk about it with my bosses or even my fellow rangers. See, there's something I learned early on. It's that there are some subjects on the job that are just taboo to speak about. This all fell under that category. Even with the first footprints that I found, and I tried to ask my boss, me being young and ignorant and naive to the job, I didn't realize it was one of those things, and so he just got really quiet. He wouldn't answer me. Or if he did, 
he would give me either rhetorical questions as answers, or just very short-form, one-word answers. I got the hint after that. And I'll never even forget when I was trying to talk to one of my early friends who worked along the job with me. I started talking to him. At the time, I had already had my first sighting, and I was telling him about what I saw. He stopped me, looked me in the face very seriously, and said, we're not supposed to be talking about these things, and walked away. I was kind of shocked by the sudden tonal change in seriousness, but I realized there's something to this. There's something about this that we're not supposed to talk about, and I don't know why. Now after that, of course, I would go on to have my two other sightings that would bring us up to 2001. This is right around when myself began to hear of a lot of reports from campers saying that they were seeing Bigfoot, or ape-like creatures, coming in and out of the campsites. One visitor in particular claimed that while she was hiking in the area, all of a sudden, she saw these big red eyes staring at her from across the bushes. She froze and heard a very loud scream off in the distance. The scream seemed to shake the ground around them. The immense tone and bass was enough to frighten them. And as far as I know, they have never returned to this park. That's when the National Park Service, to my knowledge, had begun heavily investigating these sightings. But they hadn't found anything conclusive as of yet. Oh, you know... I can't find it now, but there was a Reddit post that I read a while back. Somebody had actually described an encounter with a Sasquatch in the Tetons. They said that the Sasquatch had looked at them, took a step forward, bluff charged them, and then ran away. This same person also claimed to have had rocks thrown at them by Bigfoot, and have seen these things crossing through the campsites at nighttime. One lady and her husband who had camped just slightly off the trails, something that we definitely prohibit as much as we can for not just camper safety, but for wildlife safety as well. She claims that two of these large hairy creatures came and visited their campsite in the night, tearing apart all their food and eating their entire pack of bagels and sandwiches. She at first assumed it was a bear until she stepped outside of her tent at dusk and saw these two things approaching her camp. Completely petrified, she fled back to her tent, along with her husband. They weren't armed, and I believe only had a knife. But I think they knew that a knife was not going to do anything against these large, unknown creatures. These creatures spent hours scavenging through their supplies and food, and ate the majority of it. And from what she told, these Bigfoots never bothered getting into the tent, or trying to get to them, the man and his wife. It appears they were like bears in the sense that they were more interested in the food they smelt. Prior to that event, in the evening, just about two hours before this, the man had been cooking steaks and barbecuing ribs. One can only assume that the smell of that, the wonderful aroma of food, must have drawn these things in. Now, the lady also described a weird chattering noise, and the sound she described is always stuck with me because other reports talk about hearing a very strange and similar noise. The way she described the chattering, she said it was like two Vietnamese people having an argument. Very high-pitched, very fast, but it had almost this squirrel kind of chatter to it. It's very hard to explain. She mentioned these specific things because she actually worked around a few Vietnamese people and was very familiar with the language they spoke in terms of tonality, cadence, pitch, and most importantly, inflection. That's how she was most importantly able to connect the two. But obviously, I don't think Bigfoots were speaking Vietnamese. And that's not what she was saying. But she was saying their chatter was very similar. But regardless, it freaked her and her husband out. I don't think they've been back to that camping spot for a long time. When she made the report, she appeared pretty traumatized from the whole thing. I mean, who wouldn't be? At this point, this email is getting pretty long, and so maybe I'll write you a part two, because I have a lot more things to share with you. But for now, I'll just let you off with that we're not supposed to share this stuff, as I've said. I can only assume by everything that I've seen since then, and even more so, 
there must be a large population of them around this area, and all throughout the Pacific Northwest into Idaho. This is not a misidentification. They are far too big and look far too different to be a bear or any other animal for that matter. It's simply undeniable. These things have also been spotted all the way down to Yellowstone, so there's something going on. What that something is, we won't know, probably, if not ever. The encounters I'm about to share with you had taken place with a family in the Sawtooth Mountains, located in the state of Idaho. This man had been following a rather steep path along the mountainside when encountering something terrifying. He claimed that it sounded like somebody was screaming, although it did not sound human. The scream also seemed to be moving around, which added to the fear that something not human was nearby. Petrified, the man and his family tried to find their way back down the mountain, but all were surrounded by screams. They claimed that the screams were becoming so loud that they were beginning to go deaf and have now shown signs of hearing loss from the sheer decibel level of these screams. Idaho has always been known to have some very strange sightings, UFO occurrences, Bigfoot occurrences, and other strange paranormal phenomenon lurking in the forests. In fact, yet another witness account from these same Sawtooth Mountains claims to have experienced what he knew as a time anomaly, experiencing one himself and meeting somebody who has also been through one. I'll share those with you right now. First, the man whom shared these with me is different than the man and his family who were in the mountains that I just described, that had heard the screaming all around them. That is not exactly conclusive as to what made the noises or screams, although being a ranger, I've heard many things, much speculation, although I can't be sure. I would like to think that maybe it could have been a mountain lion, but I'm not exactly sure. Now, the man in which he had experienced a time anomaly stated that as he was hiking up in the Sawtooth Mountains, he felt that there was a thunderstorm approaching that day. He claimed that the air felt a little more staticky than usual. He could feel the moisture in the air, although it was a fairly clear day, not really much of a cloud in the sky. He thought that was strange, and so he continued on his journey. Now, this man had never experienced anything unusual during his hikes, as he had visited all over the state, and this was not his first time within the mountains itself. But after what he describes as kind of a blackout event, he remembers coming back too, kind of dazed and confused. He ended up going back down the mountain a few hours later on the other side of the path, where he met two hikers that looked like they were out of the ordinary. Now this man claims that these two hikers, a man and a woman, who were probably older, maybe in their later 40s or early 50s, were giving our witness strange looks. Just to kind of recap, our witness is a man in his mid-twenties, or so at the time. He claims that this older couple looked like they were straight out of the early 1980s. They had just given him strange looks. When our witness made it back down to the base of the trailhead several hours later, it was nearing evening time. And this is when everything became extremely weird. At the base of the trailhead, it was much more undeveloped than it was when he had first approached. Not only that, that things looked different. His car was no longer there. And all the vehicles in the parking lot were much, much older. In fact, none of them looked like they were beyond the late 80s. Something weird was happening. All the people walking around were in 80s fashion, clothing, and styles. This was back in 2015, or so our witness describes. Luckily, there was a ranger working nearby, in which our witness came and began speaking to the ranger, asking if anything weird had happened nearby. The ranger, looking at our witness, very perplexed and not understanding what he was getting at, also giving him weird looks by his sense of fashion, and he asked the question, What year is it? When the ranger gave him the strangest look, and said verbatim from our eyewitness, It's 1982, have you been living under a rock? And our eyewitness's eyes just grew the size of saucer plates. Now, 
Our eyewitness, in that moment, also started to think this was some huge elaborate prank or something was going on. In that moment, he pulls out his smartphone, which I believe was an Apple 5C, and shows it to the ranger saying, no, look, it's August 4th, 2015. The ranger, apparently astonished by the small calculator computer device in the man's hand, was practically blown away by the phone. Our eyewitness spent the next several minutes trying to convince this ranger that it was indeed August 4th of 2015, and not 1982. And after a few short minutes of being unsure of this gentleman, the ranger steps aside and starts to make a phone call to the authorities. Our eyewitness runs back up the trail, out of fear, and makes it about a mile away. Exhausted, he completely collapses on the ground, completely out of his mind, wondering what has just happened. What even is life at this point? He's starting to question his reality, thinking he's going insane, wondering if he really did somehow travel back in time, and it really is 1982. And as he's sitting there contemplating life and contemplating, ultimately, what to do next, he claims that he seemed to be propelled by this force, like almost like he was pulled in this direction. So, following this energy is how he described it. He moved further up the trail, and further and further, up off the trail, and probably about a mile out. The only way he would describe it is this, this unseen force was pulling him, telling him where to go, and he was simply following it, kind of describing it like the same way your gut instinct would feel, where you just know what to do and know where to go. After going into a very dense patch of woods, he tells me that he began to feel very, very lightheaded, kind of like when you do when you drink alcohol, but this was more like he had had blood loss or something. He began to get very dizzy and start to stagger. He claims the world around him kind of vibrated almost, the same way water does when you touch it, as if it was a liquid reflection. And the next thing you know, he claims he lost consciousness again. The next thing, he wakes up and he's been shaken awake by a park ranger. Completely different than the ranger he had spoken to, apparently back in 1982. He jolts up and there are other hikers around him. Apparently he had just collapsed on the trail and he's screaming out of fear, asking this ranger, is it 1982? And the ranger just looks at him strangely and says, no, this is August 4th, 2015. Are you okay? My name is Don. Proceeds to ask him all the normal questions. Completely disturbed and shaken up, he's not sure what to make of the whole thing. He started his day off at the trailhead, made his way to a certain point on the mountainside, experienced the strange blackout sensation, and apparently was in 1982. He swears he did not dream this. He did not make this up and that he firmly stands by he experienced some sort of time warp or time anomaly. After spending time with this ranger, he explained his situation, and the ranger wasn't exactly sure what to make of this young man, thinking or assuming he had just done a copious amounts of drugs. But the young man, or our eyewitness, seemed incredibly sober, shocked and very genuine in his expression of his emotions. He also informed the ranger that he doesn't drink, do drugs, and is very clean, doesn't even really party. Fast forward through all of that, he made his way back to the lot, and sure enough, all the vehicles were from modern time, and his own car was in the exact spot that he left it. This young man had reached out to one of my close colleagues, who, although is a ranger, has a heavy interest in UFOs, aliens, and the paranormal. He reached out to him through the grapevine and told his story in hopes that more would believe him. He wants nothing other than validation. He doesn't want a notoriety. He doesn't want any fame. He doesn't even want his name being out. And so out of respect for his wishes, I will leave his name out of the story. We will refer to him as Jeffrey. Jeffrey, upon being investigated further, was found to have no trace of drugs in his system, alcohol, or any substances whatsoever nor has he ever had any history of mental illness or anything of the likes. He's even proven this with his own medical records. In fact, further testing found that he was completely sane 
and totally cognizant of everything around him. In fact, Jeffrey is a very smart, studious young man who is currently in college for microbiology, or was, at the time of this sighting. He's very analytical, very to the point, so as you can imagine, for something like this to happen to him was literally life-altering and really opened up the entire branch in the realm of the unknown, supernatural, and of course, time travel, something he would have scoffed at years before. While he isn't all gun ho about time travel, he does believe that what happened to him is that he must have stepped into some sort of portal or warp or something. He is also a very large advocate of alternate dimensions and realities, assuming that possibly he must have stepped through a portal that took him to another reality that is the same as ours, just in a different time. His claim ultimately was that this scared him pretty badly. I'll stop here for now, and if you have any more questions about Jeffrey, please feel free to email me back. And if you want to use this story for your channel, maybe you want to read it to your viewers, that's fine. If they have any questions, they can be sure to ask in the comment section, and I'll go ahead and reply the best I can. Hi, my name is Jonathan. I've worked in the Forest Service now for roughly 17 years. Let me just start off and say I'm a huge fan of your channel and all the work you put out. Thank you. You're kind of like a YouTube David Polites, at least when it comes to cryptids. I really, really appreciate your work. I think you putting on a platform like this, allowing people to come forth with their real-life encounters, is going to help a lot of lives, more so than you'll ever know. Now, let me take away from my fanboying at the moment, because I actually do have a story that I think you'll be interested in sharing. This didn't happen while I was working, but came from a very close and trusted colleague of mine who's worked in the service longer than I, and himself is a firm believer in the paranormal, ghosts, and hauntings after this. He says that years ago, he was working as a part of the search and rescue. A man by the name of Dave Groves, which, by the way, is not his real name, but redacted and changed for the sake of the story, had gone missing for four days. Apparently, Mr. Groves was found, but completely psychotic when he was discovered. He was naked, had been eating wild animals, just raw, and my colleague claimed that his eyes were pitch black. No iris, nothing, just all black. He attempted attacking the rangers by biting them and clawing at them when trying to rescue him. It's even a miracle and somehow he did not die of exposure because the nights in this area were dropping down to 20 degrees at night. And yet, the only clothes the man had had when he had last seen was simply a t-shirt and some pants. No coat or nothing. They never did find his clothes, only him. He had to be restrained before he was rescued. After taken to the hospital and treated for anything that he had, which my colleague didn't dive into, when the man came to again after blacking out, he claimed that he had been possessed by a demon and that this supernatural entity threatened him with death unless he did exactly what this entity said. Apparently, this entity asked to possess his body, in which he allowed this thing to enter into his body. Very disturbing if you actually heard the real account. Now, this entity actually threatened to hurt his family and his kids if he did not comply. It somehow knew where he lived, knew the names of his children and his relatives. He was clearly dealing with something beyond his realm of comprehension something from another world. I want to reiterate that this terrified the rangers and the authorities working on this case. They had no idea what to make of this man. Here was Mr. Groves, a 46-year-old high school teacher, or was at one point, completely devoid of any illnesses, and was actually very intelligent, holding two PhDs, and had a profound love for the outdoors, and now claiming he was possessed by this demonic entity, it just didn't make sense. But he would go through bouts and periods where his eyes would just become completely black and he would start acting like a wild animal. No coherent thought. No way of communicating other than growling and clawing. Unfortunately, 
He had to be restrained for the majority of the time he was at the hospital, which was another 11 days. He even bit one of the nurses and tore a piece of flesh from her arm. After being released from the hospital, I guess he was told that he needed to see a priest, so he saw a Catholic priest, but even the priest refused to do an exorcism on him because the priest was too terrified of his condition. Mr. Groves tried to return back to life as normal as possible, but after about three to four weeks, he ultimately just disappeared. Nobody knows his whereabouts, and he has been missing ever since. This was 2003, and to this day, according to my colleague, Mr. Groves has never been found. Search and rescue missions are never exactly easy. They can prove to be incredibly emotionally and physically difficult at times, along with managing a team and making sure everybody is diehard and on the same page as you. And managing a team can be even more difficult. Not only is it incredibly strenuous, but it also drains resources, time, and everyone's emotional energy. This search and rescue mission had been no different when we had come across an abandoned campsite. There were seven campers in total who had been now reported missing. And this was right in the middle of a national park that is known to have extremely dangerous weather patterns, and even lately, even more so with the unpredictable weather. There had been a storm brewing coming in from the west when we began working our way higher up ground, looking for any signs or traces of life. There is no cell service here, so if one were to be injured or lost, it's basically impossible to contact anybody unless you can manage to climb to higher ground. And even then, getting an approximate location is not always guaranteed. We came across this campsite fairly early on in our search, but decided to hold off on exploring it further until we had finished the initial area, scouring the perimeter for any real signs of life. However, after several hours of searching and searching, and not finding anyone. Our dog seemed to catch a scent trail. Bingo. This was the meal ticket we needed to find these campers. We began following the dogs in the direction they pulled us, about 600 yards down a small hill in the forest. We all got hit with this terrible odor. It was death mixed with rotting flesh. It all made us instantaneously nauseous. And judging by the fresh footprints in the snow, Leading up to the site, it meant that somebody was here, but nobody could survive being out here for this long, not with a storm coming. After going a little further, we could see what appeared to be a large hole in the ground. This is exactly where the dogs were leading us to. We inspected further, and we could tell by approaching this hole that the ground had actually caved in right here, probably from the sheer weight of snow and ice. As we approached this opening, and we looked down, we found all seven hikers. All of them had fallen to their death, roughly 40 feet below. But in this weather, as cold as it was, and having them only been missing for the short amount of time, there's still no reason why that horrible odor of death and rotting flesh was as strong as it was. And we can never trace that smell, because the smell was not coming from the small cave in the ground. It was coming from all around us, like we had walked in this thick cloud that enveloped us. As these bodies were retrieved, they all had something very disturbing. They all had this strange mark burned into the left side of their cheek. Every single one of them. It was almost like looking at a brand of some kind, like they had been branded. And upon further inspection of their corpses, neither of them had actually died from impact of falling. In fact, the medical examiner could not find a sign of death. It's as if they had just dropped dead. There was no outward physical signs of death or damage to the body. No fractured bones, no torn flesh, but yet none of it made sense. Somehow there was this cave in the ground that spanned roughly 30 feet in diameter and dropped to about 40 feet below in a rocky alcove. And past the alcove it dropped even deeper so deep you could not even see because it was dark. Why were they all down here together? Did somebody dump them down here? That's how it was starting to look. But I'll say it again. After examining each corpse, besides the strange brand mark on each of their faces, 
on the left side of their cheek. There were zero signs of murder or foul play suspected. Multiple photographs were taken of this symbol and put through various databases to try and find a match, but there were none. Still completely unsure of what to make of this whole thing, everybody was certainly perplexed by it all. We had never seen something so crazy as this. Now, what I'm about to tell you kind of makes things more disturbing. One of the males of the group, apparently it had a long metal rod stuck into his forearm. And I don't mean when he fell. The coroner noticed something underneath the skin. Upon cutting it out, it was this long, strange round piece of metal, maybe roughly no more than 8 inches in length total, right in his forearm. When doing a further analysis on this piece of metal, it also turned out to be no known type of metal that we have here on Earth. For as small as it was, in girth and size, it was incredibly strong. It would not bend. It was in no way malleable and emitted static electricity at times. These things about the body are things that I did not myself see personally, but things I was told through friends and the coroner himself. A huge investigation was conducted by not just on these hikers, but the entire surrounding area, and nothing could be found. No trace of these hikers' disappearances, no trace of their death or murder, no trace of a murderer, and no trace of this putrid death smell that still lingered in the area once these bodies were long gone. In fact, the smell only seemed to extend and reach further out, lasting up to four weeks after this happened, before just one day suddenly disappeared. And keep in mind this place is covered in at least two to three feet of snow. Temperatures are often dropping down at 10 degrees at night, and yet this rotting flesh putrid death smell was as pungent as ever. It was like being trapped in the back of a van or so with dead rotting animals in the summertime in 100 degree heat. The odor was that strong. While I can only myself speculate on all the things it could be, I can tell you what it definitely is not. I do not believe that these hikers were murdered in any way. I believe that, after everything I know, something else much darker happened to them. Were they abducted? I don't know. I can't say that. But something took them from their campsite, 650 meters up from this spot, and placed them down in this hole in the earth, 40 feet down, where they were all dead. Oh, and I should also mention that their time of death all seemed to be about the same time. What everything pointed to was that they were somehow taken, or they disappeared, they were branded. Judging by the evidence, I'm assuming they were all killed somehow and placed together in this hole in the earth. It's stories like these that really rattle your brain at night, because... A lot of times, you'll have very normal search and rescue missions. People disappear, you find them, everything is okay, or you don't find them, and everything is not okay. But oftentimes, search and rescue missions happen where you don't find or do find somebody, and there are some very, very disturbing attributes to their entire disappearance. Or when you find them, there are some very disturbing things about finding their body, or finding them alive. Look. I'll be honest with you. I wish I myself had more answers, and clearly, I don't. That's kind of why I'm sharing this story with you, in hopes that maybe you can kind of bounce me back some speculations and maybe some theories about what you think could have happened. I know you're not necessarily a guru, but surely you've read enough and researched enough that there has to be some sort of explanation. I mean, I don't know what else to think. If my mind goes the whole alien UFO route, I feel crazy. But if my mind goes the route of a murderer, or some sort of occultic rituals, I think of the logistics and the practicality of how this all took place, and how none of this makes sense or even seems probable. So, I've been reading these stories for a while now, and I thought it was about time that I would finally share mine. It happened when I was just starting to work as a ranger, for the state of West Virginia. I had been running the trails by myself this day and heard something that sounded like screaming coming from up ahead. Being the good little ranger that I am, I decided to investigate things. As I got closer, the sound intensified, but there were no words being spoken almost as if whatever was making the noise was trying to draw me closer. 
so I'm following this screaming, because it kind of sounds like a mountain lion, but it sounds very humanistic, like somebody had genuinely needed help. So, after following for a short while, I come to this small cliff section where I am seeing a mountain lion, actually. The source of this noise is going absolutely crazy right next to its den. I'm watching this in awe, because this mountain lion is clearly distressed about something, and he's going crazy, or she's going crazy, screaming and making all sorts of noise. Remember, I was a real bad rookie at this point. I didn't know much about animals, and this was really my first run-in with even mountain lion screaming. Which, by the way, if you've never heard, you can Google. It does sound a lot like a human screaming. Anyway, this mountain lion began screaming and yelling, or making the roaring sounds like it was screaming, and then slowly started backing away from the den entrance. And you could start to hear the heavy sounds of something big coming out towards the den. Instinctually, I was thinking, let me guess. A bear had somehow taken residence or curiosity in this mountain lion's den, and now the two were fighting. But before that thought could even finish going all the way through my brain, this hulking, hairy figure steps out into the entrance of the den, reaches down in one motion, picks up the mountain lion. The mountain lion fights back, but this thing is not even phased. It grabs the mountain lion's head, twists it like it's nothing, completely breaking the neck, and then throwing the body very hard up against a massive fir tree nearby. And you can hear its spine crack from the 60 feet away that I was watching this thing. And then the body slumped down. This thing, staring at the body, let out a frustrated grunt and flared its nostrils, kind of all huffy and puffy, and then walked back into the den. My jaw was literally on the ground, and I was pale. I had never been so scared in my life. I picked up my jaw, and I ran as fast as I could. And when I got back to my truck, I didn't know exactly who to call or what to say. I had never seen anything like this before. And even to this day, I speculate what it was that that even was. What did I see and what did I stumble upon? I felt like my heart was about to beat out of its chest. I will say this though, that out of all the years I've done this, that was the only thing that sticks out to me is completely out of the ordinary. Because after this, I've never actually told another soul about this. You're the first one. Congratulations. I was too scared and always have been too scared to tell any of my fellow rangers or even my bosses. I didn't want to lose my job or get called crazy or made fun of. But perhaps these sorts of things are much more common than I realize. Maybe I should learn to be a little more open-minded in sharing my experiences. Even so in this field of work, I just feel so apprehensive about the whole thing. I wanted to know if you had any guesses of what it is that happened. Was this really a Bigfoot's den? Or was this thing invading the mountain lion's den? Because you need to know that seeing this thing kill a mountain lion in front of me, with such ease, twisting its neck like it was crumpling up a piece of paper, so effortlessly, and then shucking its body as hard as it could against the base of a fir tree, breaking its spine, and seeing it just slump and die there. You don't just see anything that makes a mountain lion look like that. We're talking about an animal of considerable force and size, something I myself would run far, far away from. Whatever that creature is, Bigfoot or not, I want nothing to do with it. I'm not a park ranger myself, but I have many close people in my circle who are rangers and work in the forest industry as well as work in the CSI, CSA, NSA, government, military, and law enforcement. One individual who I wanted to share with you had overseen a number of national parks up in Alaska during the early 2000s. He has come forward with me with claims that he and his colleagues had patrolled a number of parks in the state since he was higher up in management and wasn't just a base ranger. Now, according to this ranger, many of the people and staff who worked in parks in the state claimed they encountered these werewolf-like humanoids, or what they referred to as wolf people. And according to this particular ranger, national park staff working up in Alaska 
have been encountering these types of terrifying creatures for nearly decades now, or at least since the 1930s, primarily happening after World War I, which leads to a lot of speculation that these wolf people are actually genetic experimentation. There's even speculation that post-World War II, there was Nazi scientists developing human hybrids, and that these wolf people had a part to play in it. Or, should I say, the outcome. A lot of the older generations, though, kept this information tucked down. And these wolf people are only among the very few humanoid encounters that seem to take place in Alaska. It's like the more remote location, the more vulnerable our rangers are. There's also a common creature, or I guess as you call them, cryptids, that you people refer to as crawlers. There are these white humanoids that generally crawl around on all fours, have black eyes, and run really fast, or should I say crawl really fast. According to my sources, there are a multitude of rangers who have had first-hand accounts with these creatures as well, among many other humanoid encounters. While many of them usually flee the scene or run away from the rangers, some of these have become increasingly hostile, almost to show sort of territorial behaviors. While some, it's speculated that they act this way over food sources, but we're not exactly sure. I can tell you though, as far as the wolf people go, the NSA, the military, and government branches have all been involved quite heavily. They are aware of their existence, but they're working very hard to keep things under wraps. They are doing whatever they can to keep the public from ever knowing about their existence. Hence, writing off sightings, writing off video evidence as hoaxes, even creating fake hoaxes themselves to try and deter anybody from believing such a thing. Why might they be doing this, you ask? Well, I myself am not exactly sure. That's part of being a researcher, and part of looking more into these situations more in depth. Now, looking back at the humanoid portion of the whole thing, one link my ranger did find is that in areas where there is a higher amount of recorded satanic ritual activity, there always seems to be more cryptid activity. I cannot speculate myself and say that there is any real connection between the two, because personally, I don't believe that these beings, humanoids or cryptids, whatever you want to call them, are in any way spiritual. So, I would have to disagree with my friend here, but I cannot argue against the data he has collected. There are more things than just Bigfoot out there. Other notable humanoids he's described seeing is things like aliens, of course, goatmen, even the Kashtuka, mimics and flesh gates, serial murderers, wendigos, apparitions, and probably one of the most terrifying things he's ever told me is these giant arachnid-like beings. They are humanoid to an extent, but primarily arachnid. They've had stories about them finding people under the ground in these small tunnels, webbed up by these beings, and the same way a spider drains blood and fluid from a body. These beings do the same thing to their victims. It's almost like we're living in a horror fantasy world. And for these things to exist is downright terrifying. In fact, he shared quite a handful of encounters today, and I want to share them with you. So excuse the very long introduction. The first one was an elderly woman who was found in the southern point of Alaska. Not the most southern point. But she was found in a tunnel that looked to be man-made or made by something under the ground. She was probably about 50 feet deep in the ground, covered in this white web-like substance and completely drained of all her fluid. Well, the rangers here had been finding multiple people like that. Of course, she would never hear about such a thing. The panic that would ensue from the general public would be immense and unrepairable. That's like opening a can of worms you can never seal back up. And this was reported back in 2001, right before the whole 9-11 event, actually. Since then, there have been 112 other documented cases of finding individuals in tunnels underground, also enshrouded in this web-like material and drained of their fluids and blood. One of the park rangers whom I speak to, not the one I was mentioning about, but another one, has personally shot at one of these things himself. While going down to retrieve one of the bodies, one of these things was coming towards him, in attack mode. 
he fired off a couple shots and scared it away. Said he has never been so terrified in all of his life. He too described the same thing the other ranger has, that they were kind of humanoid spider looking thing. In fact, the only reference he really brought up was The Thing, the movie, and said that's kind of what it reminded him of, but it wasn't that. While things like that go on in the wild of Alaska, another very disturbing story was a fellow ranger, whom I didn't get the chance to speak to, but him sharing his story through colleagues of mine, he came across quite a grisly sighting, a small family being torn apart and eaten on by a group of these rabid wolf people. It was a dad, a mom, and two young children. All four were pretty much completely eaten on by this pack of them, and there wasn't much left other than some tissue and bones here and there. The ranger stated that had he not killed one of them himself, he would have been the next meal. So when people try to come at you and say that these wolf people are harmless and they're just curious why they don't ever hurt you or why they don't ever do anything, and make note that there are many stories and accounts out there of people actually being murdered, eaten, and torn apart by these things. But you won't hear about those. Those are the stories that get pushed down. They do not get released to the public. It's only the ones that people see these things and that nothing happens. Those are the ones that seem to be allowed to be released to the public. And I'm not sure why. So I'm hoping this one makes it out there and that people will hear. Plus, there's also the infamous Land Between the Lakes encounter. And if you haven't read that, go educate yourself and read up on that. That was down in Kentucky, though. Not up here in Alaska. But very similar situation. These wolf people are killing machines. They are like any of the other cryptids or humanoids. They are not fearful of trying to kill you. And they will at any given second they can. If the situation is right, they will end your life and not think twice about it. Now... Another humanoid being I wanted to touch upon was the Goat Man. What many people think is myth is actually more real than you could ever imagine. And up here in Alaska, terror runs freely. One of my sources found a man nearly bleeding to death after having his lower arm torn off after trying to work and clean on his boat. A man who lived in a much more rural secluded spot but by a national park. He said that one of these things, a Goat Man, had come out of the woods and came and attacked him, bit him, and tore his front arm off. When we found him, he was bleeding out, nearly unconscious. Had we not found him earlier, the man would have died. The man claims he just barely had enough time to get away from this thing, all by losing his arm. He claims that he was just sitting there, polishing his small boat, and we're talking about a very small boat here, a one that you can maybe fit two or three people in, and he was sitting there cleaning it, polishing it, and this thing comes out and runs at him, clawing at him, grabbing hold of him and taking a bite down, tearing off his lower arm. He managed to shoot at it and drive it away, but not while almost bleeding out and dying. There was also yet another report that happened in more northern Alaska with a small youth group. I can't recall the church, but it was a youth pastor and probably about 12, 13 kids. This creature, a goat man, had been stalking and watching the youth pastor. Upon seeing this thing and being completely terrorized, the thing hid back in the woods and disappeared. This was actually in one of the national parks on a large youth group camping trip. And when the youth pastor was asked about what he saw, he claims that it looked like a minotaur. That was the closest thing he could think of, judging by the way the face was, the coloration, and the horns and he claims that it scared him half to death. I've even got a chance to talk to some of the elders of some of the tribes around there. They themselves have crazy harrowing stories of these wolf people, and even things like Sasquatch fighting it off and duking it out for food, and their food being the natives, because both the wolf people and Sasquatch both are carnivorous beings. While the Bigfoot or Sasquatch, call it whatever you want, has been noted as eating other things besides human flesh. They do have quite a taste for human beings. Same with wolf people, but they also all eat deer. Anything they can, really. As a matter of fact, they have many stories alone of Sasquatch stealing children from their villages, stealing women, raping, 
forcing them to mate with these Bigfoot beings. Among the many hunters and tribal warriors who have died in the hands of these Bigfoot-like creatures, these territorial behemoths who guard certain sections of the wood, never allowing anybody to enter past, and of course their uncanny connection to UFOs and aliens. And speaking of aliens, I actually believe the close encounters of a third kind was done by a real account up in Alaska. So, it just goes to show you that Alaska is indeed a hotbed of paranormal UFO humanoid encounters. It will continue to stay this way for as long as I know. And that's all I'll share with you for now. If you'd like to have more, please reply back. I'll try and gather more stories from you and see what I can share. Thank you for your time and patience. One of my most terrifying ranger stories happened when I was just 22. I was a much newer ranger on the job, and as of this night, I was the only ranger on the job. I had just finished my patrol in the area when I got a call from my dispatch. It appeared to be that a group of hostile humanoids had been sighted in a part of the park where there had been a lot of activity lately. This was new to me, and I wasn't told or used the word humanoid over the dispatch call. It was that there were issues. But I guess apparently hearing from my fellow rangers, they were already in our territory. I was told to go and see, but to not engage without backup from other rangers or any law enforcement. So I was armed with my emergency equipment, a flashlight, and headed out into this heavily wooded area with some limestone cliffs. It was just about an hour before sunset, and I walked up the trails trying to see if I could spot anything out of the ordinary. I didn't think much of it at first, but I had been walking for a while when I began hearing this strange screaming noise. At first, I thought it was maybe a mountain lion, you know, because we do sometimes get calls about them. But then it stopped, and I heard voices off in the distance. I hurried towards where the creatures were spotted, and that's when things got pretty scary. It appeared, by the physical sight, that there were two or three male subjects standing around in the evening, and what I was looking at appeared to be giants, and not just giants like you would imagine, but these were about people who were all around 15 or 16 feet tall. They looked Slavic, very tall and skinny, unusually skinny, all very pale, long beards, long hair, and kind of malformed somehow like they looked like they were maybe mutants or something. And they were speaking to each other in this very, very strange language. One of them looked over and spotted me, and they all got up and started running after me. That's when I began screaming and made my way running back as fast as I could. I began calling for backup, for any other rangers or officers in the area who would actually listen to me. But by the time I made it back safely, I did have the backup I needed but it was too late. When we all went back to the area, these strange large humanoids were now gone. The only thing remaining were feet prints, which were casted and taken note of. But easily, one of the most terrifying experiences I've ever dealt with in my life. And this is where my story almost kind of bleeds into a paranormal thing. So, I guess at some point or another, after this had happened, that there was some excavating going on right in the same area, and apparently, they dug up multiple sets of skeletons that were far larger than humans. Now, let me explain that a little bit better. The skeletons they dug up were kind of human, but kind of more deformed, and they measured to around 15 to 16 feet in length, from base of the toe to the top of the head. So think humans, but double or triple the size, and having some bone malformations which then I got this crazy idea that what if I saw their spirits that day? What if it was the spirits of these dead giants, what I saw, which would also explain why they disappeared? Now keep in mind this is just a theory, and is in no way based on anything really factual or any hard evidence to back that claim up. But it just makes me wonder, I mean, I know as a ranger, all sorts of strange stuff happens, seeing lights in the sky, dealing with aliens and other strange beings. I know it's a possibility. I guess I should ask you, 
What do you think? It's been at least 10 years now, but the park in which I worked at for the Forest Service has dealt with some very disturbing and grisly murders. While looking at all the evidence, we can seem to trace all this back to occultic rituals and activity, or so we speculate. In the past 10 years alone, activity has shot up over 300%. Now I know that may not seem like a lot, but it has gone from virtually none to a lot, and we've gone to find many more murder cases. And not just any traditional murder, I'm talking people killed in horrible ways. And a lot of it stems from the search and rescue team, finding missing hikers, but just bound up and killed in awful ways. In fact, one man who went missing back in 2012 was found seven days later, hung upside down, stripped naked, with his eyeballs removed. It was unclear how the man actually died, but the findings were disturbing, to say the least. They have found many others who were disemboweled, cut up in pieces or worse, filleted, burned, and ultimately disemboweled and dismembered. But the strange thing is, people who usually do these kinds of murders are reckless, not surgical, not like the way these things were. Many of these murders when looking at the inflicted wounds, were all done with surgical precision, as if done by a highly advanced surgical cutting tool, and not like a scalpel or a knife. We're talking with something sharp, something almost like a laser, that would sear the flesh as it cut. I have no idea if that is some sort of ritual thing, or if there's any explanation to that but I know there have also been sightings of pentagrams being found marked on trees, marked in the ground, and people walking around in robes with torches, being spotted very late at night by other campers. Of course, I and many of my other fellows have not noticed such a thing, but we do have to take the word from our fellow campers. And so if somebody says they're seeing something, and we get enough of reports of said thing, well, we have to generally believe that. Obviously, there's something going on. So after looking into it more, we too are finding evidence that, again, is very disturbing. Now, let me just say this, that with the whole COVID pandemic, things have dramatically slowed down. But before, things were a lot more lively, and activity was bustling. I've also seen the evidence, too, that people are talking about seeing more and more strange figures appearing from the trees. Ever since our first report of satanic ritual activity, back in the fall of 2009, it seems that we've been getting struck with apparitions visiting our park. Trust me, I am not a believer of ghosts. But again, I have to go by what the majority of people who spot these things say, and all the descriptions line up. Now I know there's no way that all these people somehow know each other in real life. Therefore, I have to take what they say seriously, and cautiously, and scan out the things that happen. And just a matter of fact, I'll give you an example. A ranger friend of mine, who actually used to work at this park, who does not anymore, had some crazy stories of his own. And I think this was back in 2011, possibly 2010. He was doing what rangers normally do in the park, at night, patrolling, and he began hearing human voices shouting somewhere off in the distance. And how, mind you, the closest road is over five miles away, so there wasn't anybody camping over in this direction. But he said that the voices began coming more and more his way, and he could hear that it wasn't just one voice, but a series of voices, all coming from one direction, emerging as several. And that's when he began to see multiple figures emerging from the tree line. He explained to me, firsthand that this looked like a scene out of the movie The Mist, which, if you haven't seen it, is downright terrifying. It's a movie back from the early 80s. And he explained to me that this, what he was seeing, looked like a scene at the end, where it was a bunch of these shadows of people with these red eyes. And he claimed that these were evil spirits, multiple of them, coming after him. All of them were at least seven to eight feet tall, very bulky, but he knew. He just knew that these were evil. 
He radioed once more, saying he was in trouble, and that he needed backup now. He fled away from the scene as fast as he could, not looking back until they were gone. Apparently, these figures have been spotted over a dozen times over the years, all across the park, and then vanish into thin air. We believe it's all connected with the demonic satanic activity. In fact, there was a hiker who back in 2014 had found what we believe to be a ceremonial dagger out in a small clearing where you can kind of faintly tell that a pentagram had been there some time before, written and carved out of dirt and stone. No blood, of course, and the ceremonial dagger was clean. But who knows? It really makes you wonder what's really out here. Hi. For the sake of this report, I'll be keeping my name anonymous, but... I'm a park ranger for the Buffalo National Park. This story that I'm about to share with you happened back in 2011. I was working as a relief to another ranger, whose name has also been removed from this report. It was the early evening of the first day. We were working near the Trail Ridge Road and had just finished all of our duties for the day. We decided to call it early. We both wanted some sleep before beginning work on Monday morning. This was February 13th, snowing very heavily outside. We were sitting inside, listening to the radio, and suddenly, we heard an extremely odd noise coming from somewhere nearby. I couldn't quite tell, but it sounded like somebody was screaming out in pain, and I recognized the voice of that of our, one of our female tour guides, although she was usually very calm and timid, composed even, when dealing with rough and rowdy groups. I knew unmistakably that this was her voice. There was no mistaking that. The strange thing was that many past visitors always talked about what an amazing tour guide she is, and I thought nothing of her but in a good light. So to hear her in real anguish was unsettling. It really struck the core of you. So I did what I should have done. I investigated. You could tell that as soon as you stepped outside, a storm was going to be brewing very soon and her cries carried off in the distance, and so I followed, even in the snow, and about 50 feet away from the cabin of the ranger station was blood, but it was unusually red and unusually thick, like coagulated, almost old looking. All the while the screaming continued, and began to turn more hoarse, more lower and guttural. I figured she was in danger, so I hurried as quickly as I could, but the closer I got to the woodline, the deeper her cries turned, and the more distorted her voice became, until I made it to the tree line, and I could see her, just off in the distance, in a clearing, walking my direction. But there was something horribly wrong with her. She was covered in blood, and calmly walking in my direction. So I began calling out to her, screaming her name, and she still just remained the same slowly walking in my direction. I ran and I ran, and I made it up to her. Her condition was worse than what I thought. The screaming had stopped, of course, but it was her, in an outfit I did not recognize, covered in blood from head to toe, although I could see no visible wounds underneath her clothes or visible on her flesh. It was very cold out, and she appeared to be wearing very little clothing, I remember looking at her in the eyes and asking her, What are you, crazy? It's freezing out here. What are you doing? Are you okay? Are you hurt? Do you need help? And I'll never forget this moment. Her eyes meet mine. And I knew in that moment, this, whoever or whatever this was, was not her. The eyes I was staring into were slitted like a snake. And in that moment, her skin began to turn from a beautiful blush and white to this pale, sickly green-black color, and it or her opened its mouth to reveal tons of fangs and teeth. It outstretched with long claws trying to grab hold of me when this thing's entire shape began contorting and changing. This was not her. This was something else entirely, 
and I don't know what it was, but it was not her. Completely terrified, I fell back in the snow and began to pick myself up and run as fast as I could. As the screams I heard before that were supposedly hers were now different. They had this inhuman quality to them. They sounded distorted, disgusting, and raspy, in no way now recognizable as a human scream. All the while, this being chased me, and I ran and I ran, and before nearly making it to the tree line, she or it leapt up about 20 feet in the air and landed on top of my back, snapping my knee, and I fell to the ground in excruciating pain. She lunged down with her teeth and bit into my neck, tearing my flesh open, and as I bled out there in pain and agony, I lost consciousness, and I was convinced this was the end. I could feel her claws going deep in my back as she tore flesh, tendons, and tissue. How I did not die at this point is beyond me. The next thing I know, I wake up in a hospital bed, bandaged, bruised, beaten, in a cast, in pretty rough shape, and my boss comes in and starts talking to me, and he sits down next to me, and he is really, really silent. Now I'm just coming too, so I've been completely out of it. He waits there for a moment, while I start asking him questions about what's happened, where am I? Because I could hardly remember in that moment what had even happened or transpired. He informed me that I was found in the woods in the snow, badly attacked by what he assumed was a bear. I was induced into a medical coma, and it has been 17 days since my body was found. I am lucky to be alive. But more importantly, he also had other very disturbing news that was upsetting for me to hear. And during my stay in the hospital, while I was in a coma, I had, I guess, been spotted around the park, in my uniform, in my getup and all, off deep in the woods, by myself, by my other colleagues, all the while knowing that I was in the hospital, in a medical coma, many of them assuming it was just some false illusion. But my boss claimed that something really chilled him to the bone. And it wasn't just seeing me, out in the woods, even knowing I'm in the hospital. Knowing that there is some imposter out there, wearing my skin or trying to be pretend to be me. But that during the evening time, near the end of his own shifts, he would hear my voice out in the woods, right near where they found my body, actually, screaming in pain and agony, begging for somebody to come and help me. I think deep down, he knew exactly who or what was pretending to be me.